Write the world-changing book that will help grow your personal brand and your business as it makes the world a better place. Welcome to the Author's Corner, hosted by Robin Colucci. Every episode, we bring you some of the most successful authors, as well as other industry experts, to share some inspiration, motivation, tactical strategy, and fun. We'll also talk about the challenges and trends in the publishing industry. Don't get stuck in the idea phase. Join the Author's Corner today. Start writing the book you've dreamed about. Hello and welcome to the Author's Corner. Today, my guest is my good friend, Mark Hirschberg. From tracking criminals and terrorists on the dark web to creating marketplaces and new authentication systems, Mark has spent his career launching and developing new ventures at startups and Fortune 500s and in academia. He helped to start the Undergraduate Practice Opportunities Program, dubbed MIT's Career Success Accelerator, where he teaches this course annually. Now, Mark and I met a few years ago at an event in Monterey, California, when he was thinking about writing a book. And over the next couple of years, we had several conversations where I gave him a little advice here and there. And in January this year, he released the Career Toolkit, where he shares invaluable skills for success. This is a great book for recent college grads who are just entering the workforce or anyone who wants to see their career move up that ladder. At MIT, Mark received a BS in physics, a BS in electrical engineering and AMP, computer science, and a master's of engineering in electrical engineering and AMP, computer science, focusing on cryptography. Now, I'm not an engineer or computer expert at all, but I'm hoping some of our listeners understand what all of those things mean. (laughs) But at Harvard Business School, Mark helped create a platform used to teach finance at prominent business schools. Now, his computer science background, I want you all to pay close attention here because it's going to be especially relevant for our interview today, as you're going to hear Mark share a brilliant new marketing strategy for authors that involves using a unique app that he has created and is currently testing. He also works with many nonprofits, including Techie Youth and Plant a Million Corals, And he was one of the top ranked ballroom dancers in the country. And I can attest to Mark's ballroom dancing skills as I've had the privilege of doing a little swing dancing with Mark (laughs) on more than one occasion. He now lives in New York City, where he is known for his social gatherings, including his Halloween party, as well as his diverse cufflink collection. So let's tune in and hear what Mark has to say. So welcome to the Author's Corner, Mark. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here with you today. It's so great to have you here. It's been a bummer with COVID. We haven't been able to get together in person, but it's very exciting to have you here to talk about your book and also your new app. And and I think that this is so exciting because, you know, to me, I'm seeing like an opportunity for authors that could really be the wave of the future, kind of the next wave of innovation and publishing. But before we get to all that, and before I hold up this gorgeous cover of your book, this this gorgeous copy of your book that you sent to me, just give us, tell us a little bit about Mark Hirschberg and who you are and how you even got around to doing, I'm going to hold it up, I can't wait, this gorgeous book (laughs) of the Career Toolkit. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your background and what led to your book. My background was not what you would expect to bring me here today. I graduated from MIT with a bunch of technical degrees, and I was that classic MIT nerd, began doing programming, and worked in the brilliant startups. But early in my career, I recognized I wanted to move up and get into management, become a CTO. And to do that, I said, well, you know, it's not just about being the best programmer, I need other skills. I need leadership and team building and how to hire people. And no one ever taught me any of that. So I set out to learn it. And I discovered once I had begun to learn these skills, when I would interview other people and ask them a question about leadership or communication, I'd get a blank stare because no one taught them either. And so I had to put together training material for my team 
And then a funny thing happened. I heard MIT was starting to explore these issues as well. So I reached out and said, hey, this is what I've been working on. If I can be of any help, happy to do so. They said, yeah, come on, help us develop the course. I did. And then I said, well, why don't you help us teach this as well? I said, okay. And for the past 20 years, I've been teaching these skills at MIT. It was kind of random how I wound up there. Well, 20 years, I forgot you'd been teaching it that long. Yeah, it really seems like time has flown that I've been doing it. And in fact, I was having done this for so long, I've been encouraging MIT to take this content and put it out there because I know it's not just our students who need it. And MIT has been good about putting content out there, but for various reasons, they never had time to do it. I've also encouraged them to give notes to our students because when our students learn these skills, within the walls of MIT, that's not where I want them to apply it. You, you do apply some of this, but they're going to use it on their jobs. So I said, let's write up some notes for them. And that is, well, we just haven't had time. So I, I said I was flying around a lot for my job. This is all pre-COVID, spending a lot of time in hotels, on planes. I thought, I'm going to just write up some class notes. I thought I was going to write up 20 pages of notes. <laughs> 20 pages became 30, became 50. At 100 pages, I thought, you know, this might be a book. Yeah. <laughs> and then I first reached out to Dory Clark because she is just a master. I said, Dory, I think I'm writing a book. What do I do? She gave me some great advice. And I was also fortunate to have met you at Renaissance Weekends. And you gave me great advice. And the two of you and others really helped steer me as I went on my journey for an unplanned book. Yeah, and it really, it came together so beautifully. And it really is such a terrific resource, especially for people who are trying to build that foundation of their career and really, you know, get some of that initial momentum, which, you know, it doesn't seem that long ago. It, <laughs> it's not hard. It's, it's not easy to do. And, you know, it, it, there's, there's so many golden nuggets of wisdom here. So let me ask you this, because, so then you decided to make an app. So let's hear about that journey and your thought process and what led you to that? The, the initial seed came from talking to my neighbor. And we were in the hallway one day, we, we've known each other for a while, she does marketing. And she said, oh, you should create an app to market your book. I said, oh, okay, yeah, not a bad idea. What should the app do? I said, I don't know, create an app. <laughs> okay, great, that's like, and sell a lot of books. Oh, good idea. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think of that. Why don't I sell a lot of books? So I sat there for a while thinking about what should this app do? And fortunately, I have a background not only in technology, but also marketing. And even I briefly ran a digital media company. And during this time, I spent a lot of time looking at the future of digital media and understanding how things were starting to change. And really that led to my thinking that books themselves need to change. Books, movies, all our traditional content. We have usually for the past roughly, we'll say 500, 600 years since the printing press, although even before we've given our content in a linear format. We said, here's the book and everything you need is between these pages. Now, if we think about our fiction books and that experience, the best fiction books are not simply books. Now, yes, they get turned into movies. That's every fiction writer's dream. That's where the big bucks are. But also think about Harry Potter. Think about Star Wars. You have action figures. You have an entire universe. You have toys. You have games. You can go on a ride. You have virtual reality experiences. You're saying to your audience, it's not just about reading about these characters within these pages. It is experiencing them when, where, and how you want. Mm -hmm. Now for business authors, let's think about this book and you can think about my book, think about an exercise book, nutrition book, any self-help book. Where do you read it? Sitting on your couch. Where do you use it? Well, during COVID sitting on your couch. But the rest <laughs> of the time, you're not leading from your couch. You're not networking from your couch. Now you're not gonna be carrying this book with you. So we have to take that content and move it outside of the pages. Now, the initial germination for this was just thinking about my own education background, knowing how people learn. Spaced repetition is known to work. Fancy name for flashcards or just learning it 
over and over again, right? By Not wrote. Yes, as they yes. say, by wrote. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you read this book. I know whenever I read these books, I go, oh, what a great book, really good tips. And three weeks later, you forget it. Right. So what if we could reinforce this? But no one's going to want to sit there with flashcards. No. <laughs> we came up with an app. Imagine if you took a highlighter and went to all, here's a good quote, here's a key point, put it into the app. But now no one's even going to want to open the app. But if the app each day reminds you, so you get a pop-up, right? You get a little notification. Think of it like a daily affirmation, but it's one of the tips in the book and it helps to reinforce it. Uh -huh. From the perspective of the reader, you get better retention of the content, better value. You can also open it up. If you're going to a networking event, if you're not carrying my book, open this up and quickly swipe through it. It's a little like Tinder that way. You can swipe through all this. <laughs> or you can search for a tip. From the perspective of the author, not only are you helping your reader more, which of course is our primary goal, but now you're also staying top of mind. And if you want to get that word of mouth marketing, are they going to think about a book they read six months ago? Or are they going to think about a book that every day pops up on their phone and reminds them about your book? So it's a win for both sides. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal. And it really is, you know, I'm even thinking of my book for how to write a book that sells you. And, you know, one of the hardest things, as you know, for someone who's thinking about writing a book is to get themselves to start. And, you know, sometimes just a daily reminder, I could see, you know, even if it's not, have you started yet? How about now? You know, how about now? <laughs> but I mean, just an in inspirational tip helps remind people, helps remind the reader of what they want, right? Because they picked up your book because they wanted something. And so that daily tip is a way for them to remember what they want. The other way you can use that, that's a great point. One thing I've never liked about a lot of the business books I've read is you say, okay, I just read 200 pages. That could have been 30, right? right? <laughs> a couple points and a lot of filler. And there are historical reasons why we've needed that filler that are starting to go away. But, I, and I didn't want to do that. I want to make sure there was value continuously throughout the book. If you want to approach it that way, start by writing, here are all the tips, right? Here's for chapter one, what they're getting out of it, chapter two, and so on. Put that all down as if you're just writing the bullet points, the tips that can go into the app. And then you say, now I've got my outline and now I can fill it out. And I'll, I'll note that this app, so I didn't plan on building this. I thought I'd just go license it. Someone must have done this. I was shocked that they didn't. So when I came up with it, I patented it, but then I also built a white label version because I know other authors can benefit. It's not just my book. And so I do think other authors in the future are going to need to do something like this. Yeah, so, so tell me more about the white label version. And is this something that would be available to listeners right now? Or is this still in development? Or tell, Give us the scoop, Mark. Yeah, it's ready. It's early. Uh, so I don't, for example, have automatic billing set up for it. I don't have a lot of analytics set up. But I can certainly start getting other authors to, to do this. And I want to get some people on the platform and start to use this and get certainly input. What other things haven't I thought of? Because I really do think this is going to be a key piece of selling our books. And now one important question is, you know, what does this mean for my sales? Right, wait, if I'm giving away my content. You, you stole the question right out of my brain. So go ahead. And I'm sure there's gonna be a debate I suspect most traditional publishers will balk at this idea. They're going to say, no, no, if you're giving it away, no one's going to buy the book. From my perspective, from having done things like this before, I'm sure someone out there is going to say, yeah, I'm just going to get the app. You know, I can't afford the 20 some dollars for the book. And okay, that's fine. If, if that price point was going to be high for them, it was going to be a tough sell anyway. Right. <laughs> and realistically, if you are just looking at the tips they're not going to be as meaningful when you're just scanning through going, okay, and this, and this, and this, and this. It's that context they're in, in the chapters, where you get the stories, where you get the setup, where you get how these things fit together. That's the real value. You can get some value on their own. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't even think publishers would, would really push back on this. And, and the reason is, I mean, if you think like, what is a, what is a, a TV interview, right? Where you might sit down and give 10 tips 
from your book or even five tips from your book. I mean, because you're right, without the full context, without the example story, without the setup and the follow through, you know, the tip is just a, a tip, but it does ignite the interest of the audience that's most likely to buy the book. I think the improved word of mouth marketing more than offsets any handful of people who might say, oh, I'm going to do this instead of buying the book. Right. So is, it, is the app free then for, for users? And then the author would, what is it like a subscription that you're, 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 what are you thinking of your business model? I know we're so, I love that we're on the cutting edge here at the author's yeah. corner. Just want yeah. to take a minute to acknowledge that. It's likely going to be a subscription model. And one of the things I have to figure out, there's an interesting question. My app is a standalone app. It's branded to show my book cover and it's got my imagery from the book. And we can, we can talk about that. That's an interesting thing I do as well, but it's very much branded just for my book. There's a question of whether people are going to want to download for each, each particular book, yet another app and have 20 apps on their phones. Oh, because so, it's branded. Right? So one other way we can go, and this is the way I'm likely to go, is actually doing a Kindle-like version where they say, oh, I'm reading Robin's book. Okay, I'm gonna download the tips from her book. And oh, I'm now reading Mark's, and you download his tips. And you can have multiple tips on there. You can remove or turn on whichever ones you want. That's also going to allow, especially newer authors, who want to get attention because we can then start doing things like people who read Robin's book also read these other books and we can do some promotions by putting them all into one single app. So like people getting tips, <laughs> right? People, people with this app, you know, this, this, what are you going to call it? Are, are, are like, what is, what is the, what is, what are you calling this tips, notifications app? I don't yet have a good brand name for it. So I'm oh, open to right. suggestions. Okay, did you hear that everybody? <laughs> Email Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's, um, but I see what you mean. So it would be like a platform and then people could so the user could select like which books they want to get tips from uh, based on their preferences. And they wouldn't, it sounds like they wouldn't necessarily have to buy the book to get the tips. They would just have access to that portal where they could choose a book to get tips from. Right now, I'll only support free. Later on, we're gonna, a potential feature if there's demand for it is certain tip sets might be paid only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting, yeah. The, uh, the platinum club where they get platinum tips. <laughs> but you know, and I, I would almost think it could be, I think it really would be a great way to sell the book because you know, if, if you're just getting the tips, you're like, oh, this book looks interesting. I'll get the tips for a week. And then the person might say, wow, I'm getting a lot of value from these tips. I'm gonna go get the book. I think that's more likely, frankly. Yes. Yeah, 100%. It's a good kind of try before you buy. You right. can experience it. Yeah. There are other things that we can do in the future. We have all as authors think about, oh, our social media platform, right? And how I want to reach all these people. And you might have 20,000 followers, but how many are actively paying attention to anything you post? How many are engaged? Here, you're literally in their pocket. You can be popping up every day. You can have direct engagement with your audience. There will hopefully in the future, I have a laundry list of features, notifications. Hey, I have book two coming out. Mm -hmm. Notify everyone has these tips. And <laughs> now you have, you know, full attention for just a moment, but full attention about your next book. Wow. That is so brilliant. What a great, what a powerful tool for authors. I mean, really. And I love that it's a win-win, right? Because the, the, the reader wins, the author wins, the publisher really wins too. Very yeah. smart. So smart. So uh, how, how, uh, how long, how much longer do we have to wait? How many more guinea pigs do you need? I, I would like to get a handful of beta users, by which I mean authors, 
to come on and try it out. Happy to have you because I have gotten, I know so much great advice from you <laughs> during this process. We gotta get that out to other people. And yeah, getting a few people on so we can try it out and see what works and see what's valuable to the authors and to the readers. Yeah, how exciting. I just, it really seems like the new front, the next frontier of book publishing. Because ultimately as authors, we are selling our ideas and we have to make our ideas available when, where, and how our audience wants it. The fact that it's been between two covers on printed pages is simply for historical reasons. That was the only technology we had 500 years ago. We've moved on and yes, now we can do TV, now we can do video and podcasts and Zoom calls. And so we're changing how we're delivering the information. This is the next step in that evolution. And I'm just curious, because it also seems to me it could be a jumping off point, like if an author, I'm especially, I don't know why, but I'm especially thinking of people in the health and fitness space, because there's so much instruction around nutrition and, fit and, and workouts. But I'm wondering, it, like, it seems like the tips could be a, a first step, and that, but that could be a jump off point where the author could even develop an entire app that was related to their content and, and helping the reader use it away from the book. Yes. You can imagine, fun. especially for fitness and nutrition, timing, right? We think about, there are those stretch apps, right? Hey, you've been sitting at your computer for two hours. We're going to tell you to get up right get now. Get up! Get up now! So you can imagine similar types of apps with more advanced functionality that would do things like see what you're doing, see where you are. It might recognize your location. Are you at work or are you at home and give you different tips based on that. If you're still in the office at eight at night, it might be giving you a different set of tips than if you're at home. Right, oh, interesting, wow. And I just love how you've married your technology background with your author aspirations and, and uh, created, created, you know, you're creating this whole new thing. What is that like for you? I mean, I would imagine that's probably pretty fun or cool. What, what are some of your thoughts about when you recognize that you could bring these two worlds together in this way? That was very exciting. And that's really what I've enjoyed doing throughout my life. My background, I was first trained as a physicist, but I also studied political science. Then I have degrees in computer science. I work in tech startups, but I've done a lot of marketing. I'm a de facto HR person at every company. This book is about people skills. I teach. It's a whole bunch of different things. And I remember having a moment years ago in college. We had been learning about the icing model in physics. That's the model for magnetic materials and how you have all these tiny little molecules, tiny atoms that are magnetic and how they align and nearby ones influence the other ones. And then you get consistency to get everything pointing in one direction and magnetic. Around the same time, within a week or so of that lecture, I was learning within political science about a certain type of voting model where people come together in small groups. It's similar to a, um, a caucus model. Small groups come together and then they align in a certain direction. And then that group goes on to a bigger group and they align and in the end you get a final result. And I remember thinking, wow, these sound really similar. In fact, I'll bet I can use the same math to model them and realize that there's this concept of cross-functionality. We can take ideas from one discipline, put it in another. Now, I'm not the first to think of that. In fact, the famous uh, Black-Scholes option pricing model came because there were these two finance guys who were trying to figure out how to price options. And they met Bob Merton, who was a mathematician, and Bob said, oh, well, here's how heat transfer works. We can use the same equation. And then trillions of dollars later, we now know how to price options. And it's taking <laughs> ideas from one discipline, moving it to another. I love doing that. So I love taking my background in technology and marketing and now applying it to media. That's fantastic. That's really cool. That's really cool. And, and in such an important area because, so let me ask you this, because there's still, there, there, there's this buzz about, that you know, publishing is on the way out, books are dead, publishing is ob going, becoming obsolete. And I'm really curious to hear your take on this um, in light of you know, some of the things we've been talking about today. 
I think in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't. Mm -hmm. When I began this process of creating my book, I spent a lot of time researching how publishing works. I read about 1500 articles, everything I could find on how to pick a trim size, how to think about cover design, how to think about finding an agent, every little thing. And I keep a list of about 200 that, are, that were useful articles I now keep online. <laughs> I really want to understand every aspect. And when I looked at the financials of publishing, right? What's the financial model? It's the same as the VC model, right? In my world of VCs, VCs say, okay, you're a company, you make no money. I'm going to bet on you. Here's a million dollars. And hopefully you'll turn it, you'll spin straw into gold, come up with something good. We'll probably have to do that a few more times. You'll need more rounds of funding. And then you'll be a billion dollar company and I'll make a great return. And we know with VCs, it's referred to as the Hollywood hits model because you're going to get one or two big hits. You're going to get one Google out of every 20 investments. You'll get a couple that, oh, that was a, a decent company. And most are going to fail. Right? And you're basically betting you can pick enough big winners to offset all the other losses. What happens in publishing? You're going to have a handful of books. Now, there are some guarantee ones. Right? We knew Obama's book was going to sell. Right? And they could, they could even predict how many and do the math on it. Right. But when you take a first-time author, right? when you take, uh, for example, uh, J.K. Rowling, right? no one knew it would do well, but she is the Google of the publishing world. <laughs> yeah. and so people hope they get those books and you get those runaway hits. You hope for even, hey, here's a decent book. You know, we sold 50,000 copies. Hey, that was pretty good. But we know most, most in publishing, you're going to sell a couple thousand books. You might even do worse than that if it's not selling well. And so those are your losses. You need to have enough winners to offset that. It's the same model, except the numbers are much lower and it's a single shot. Mm -hmm. And when you actually look at this and you say, well, the cost of production has really come down, right? 40 years ago, I needed to buy or rent a printing press, which was not right. easy. <laughs> now I don't need that. Literally, I can just with a word processor, type something out, do some spell checking, should do a little more than that. But in theory, <laughs> you could. Yes. And I go, to, I go to Kindle Publishing and book KDP and I am online and I now have, I should probably, I should get a cover design too. If I can get that for 50 bucks online, there's my book. So the cost of publication has dropped. Now, if you do it right, it should probably still be at least a few thousand. Right. But now that upfront cost has dropped. So then what's the trade-off? Well, the trade-off is if you're an author, it's as much work or more to market your book than it is to write it. And what the publishers do, now they'll handle this upfront costs. They'll pay for your editing. They'll pay for cover design. The question is how much marketing are they putting in? And what I've been hearing is it's less and less every day. So if it's on you to market, if you're putting in really that effort, then you know, is the trade-off of having them pay for that upfront cost versus capturing most of the returns, is that really a good trade-off for you? If you're doing the work of marketing, Maybe you should pay that upfront cost. And that's that's what's eating into traditional publishing. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just throw a couple of things in on top of that. Like, first of all, you're right. 80 to 90% of traditionally published books do not earn back the advance that the publisher paid them to write it. So you're absolutely right. The majority are losers when it when it comes to the ROI for the, for the publisher. And I do think that... Um, definitely part of the consideration of whether to go traditional or self-published is, is, you know, what you're getting back on the book sales. Obviously a royalty is much less than getting most of the cover price, depending on where you're selling your book. And, but at the same time, I think that there's, you know, like I always say it should be a strategic decision. And part of the strategy is, do you, does your message really require that you have that big brand behind your book? You know, are you, writing something controversial or, uh, you know, groundbreaking that, that maybe would, uh, or, or is it the prestige itself of having that traditional publisher that, that is actually what you're looking for more than the, the money from the sales? I think that the big challenge for publishers is that it's basically educated gambling. <laughs> I think you're comparing it to VC is, is really even more accurate than that, than my analogy. It would be, wonderful for publishers to have another way to offset some of that risk and 
you know, like, like this app idea where people can get exposure to a new book um, and, you know, really get excited about it and get some word of mouth going. I could see really being, uh, like, I think part of what's going to keep publishing from becoming obsolete. Well, the big thing is people love books and they're not going to st want to stop reading books. I think that's been pretty well established. Uh, <laughs> like, we've had eBooks for how long? And you know, how many people do you know who are like, I still want my print book. <laughs> I, I still like print. Right. I don't, I don't, I spend all day looking at a screen. The last thing I want to do is, is read a book on a screen. You really hit the other side of the coin there. So we talked about the economics. Yeah. And the economic advantage to going with a traditional publisher for your book royalties has really increased. But as you point out, the very first thing you need to ask as an author is, what are your goals? Because selling copies may not be your goal. Certainly making money from a book is usually not the goal, not from book sales. Not from book sales, right. <laughs> Does that book let you do something else? improve your consulting business, become a thought leader, lead to more opportunities. And so that's where books are really valuable. And this is where I think publishers need to evolve and say, we are in the business of ideas. Now it used to be ideas got out through books, right? This is the best way because 200 years ago, you didn't even travel very often. It was through books. Now that we are conveying these ideas through other mechanisms, the publisher needs to expand. And whether they're doing things like the app or doing things like promoting you and promoting your brand and probably taking a piece of the larger brand along with it, I think publishers need to evolve and be not in the business of selling books, but of selling content, however that content may come forth. And that's where they can add a lot of value, but means rolling back in that marketing and PR part that they've basically given up. Yeah, or they they still do it. They still do it for sure. When it comes to that marketing and PR investment, they, they're going to tend to put more into the books where they've made a bigger investment in the in the first place. Yes, uh, a lot of times as well. So they're going to bet on the horses that they are counting on to uh, to to win, so to speak. You know, another interesting aspect of the app, which I think I'll be very curious to see. It could be a potential game changer is, you know, one of the things that's become very clear to publishers, much to their chagrin, is that there's no evidence that a huge social media following actually translates to book sales. And I'm wondering, do, how do you see this idea of having this app with the tips? Do you think that that could potentially have an influence over how well books sell for people with strong social media platforms? I think it can. And I'm not an expert on social media marketing for books, mm -hmm. but I do think social media faces the challenge that there's literally billions of people on social media with messages. People are following hundreds of other people and brands. There's all these messages. There is just a lot of noise out there. It is really hard to stand out. It's really hard to get your message out. And the people who do are your super fans, right? They're the big followers. They're the ones who say, I want to see Robin's post. Now, those people are often on your mailing list. Now, mailing list, you have 100% share of voice, kind of. When they're looking at your email. <laughs> if they open it, right? 100% share of voice. When they're looking at it, they go, boom, I am focused on this email. But of course, that's one of literally hundreds of emails and we all just go, oh, it's just, yep, that's their monthly letter or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I should read that one day. <laughs> With the app, and look, one day the app might suffer the same thing. <laughs> but right now it is a new channel. There's not a lot of noise. And yeah, you are getting a handful of pop-ups. But most of the pop-ups are things that you initiated, right? There are things where you've ever said, it's my calendar alert. Mm -hmm. or maybe it's something from some other app, but it's a handful of apps you're choosing. Whether you're saying, look, I really do want to get every tweet because I work in media. The rest of us who don't say, I don't want to know about every tweet that comes out. Right, right. <laughs> and so with this app, because it's just going to be most likely once a day, we might, we might allow for people to set more, but they can control how much they get. You're going to get a lot of attention because it's not going to be a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And so I think certainly early on the first couple yeah. of years, this is going to be really powerful in reaching effectively your super fans. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's something interesting too, because, you know, I could see uh, like somebody who's really built their social platform being able to use that because I think one of the reasons why social media leaders don't necessarily perform well in book sales is that people who spend a lot of time on social media aren't necessarily readers like, or they're not necessarily reading books, but they may be totally down for getting some, some tips through the app. And, mm -hmm. and like I said, if they get that initial value, then that's a whole different conversation as, as far as getting the book. Right. It's putting in that bite-sized content that we're, we're attuned to on social media. You know what else just occurred to me? I could even imagine like having the rights to the app could be something a publisher could buy from the author. Oh, right? Interesting. Yes, I. So the author I don't know rolled into a, to know, yeah, where where this falls into media yeah, rights. Like rolled into the book deal is like the publisher gets the app rights, and then whatever would be earned. You know, if if the app was sold for like a buck or whatever, you know, like the publisher would get a percentage of every app that was sold for that book or every, every book that tips that were sold. Right. And this certainly goes to that. Like audiobook rights, right? Like right now that that's, that's one of the things they buy. And this goes to that concept that publishers need to say it's about the content. Publishers should get, should get a piece of all the different parts of the content, but in exchange for marketing and promoting the content across all platforms. Yeah. Or bigger advances or whatever, but yeah. And that's, that's, that's what happens. Like the agent negotiates like, okay, so here's all the rights that are available, right? You can, a publisher can buy the world rights. So then they can resell the right to publish your work in different languages in different countries. They can buy the audiobook rights. They can buy the movie rights. And so, and then they, and then they turn around and resell all that. So why not buy the, whatever Mark Hirschberg's app is going to be called rights. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Mark, what have I not asked you about this whole picture that I really should have asked? So we should talk about how I did the market research on the title and how I'm using the iconography across channels. Oh yeah, because this is really cool. I'm gonna do an extreme close up here because th th this is really cool, like these really great images you have here. So, all right, so let's talk about the, the, the research on the title. One thing I kind of stumbled into, and this comes from my background doing marketing. So I thought, okay, I, I kind of knew the title I wanted, or at least thought I wanted. But as one, one thing you have to do is search for availability of domain names. That's always a challenge. But I thought I'd just get a little feedback on it. And so I created just a simple survey form. You can do it with Google for free. And I created two panels. I had the panel of who my target users were. And then I had my panel of friends. And I specifically separated because it was nice to get feedback from my friends, but my friends aren't my target users necessarily. Right, right. I, wanna, I wanna make sure to keep my target users there, but feedback from everyone could be useful. And so for my title, for my subtitle, and later as we looked at covers, I would just send out a survey. I'd say, so for my friends, I just post on Facebook. For others, I have my mailing list. I'd say, okay, here are 10 titles. Right, here's what I'm thinking of, and just put out there. And all they had to do, you know, check all that you liked or pick your top three, however you want to do it, and any comments, anything you want to want to say or note. And so I got a lot of great feedback. It takes people just a handful of seconds. This is easy to set up, almost no cost to you, just a little bit of time. What I didn't realize, so I thought, okay, this is great. My friends are helping me. I appreciate it giving me something, but it actually also built some loyalty. Now, granted, among my friends, they were probably going to buy the book and support me anyway. But a lot of them wrote me and said, oh, you know, it's so great with your book coming out. It was wonderful to see the process, to feel like I was part of it. And so especially if you have your social media following, if you have a group of people, you can engage them this way. They're going to feel connected to the book. They're going to feel like they contributed. And that's going to increase their excitement about your book, increase the sales, increase their ability or their likelihood of retweeting and promoting your book. So engage your audience, get feedback, be sure you have your clear target market and then everyone else. 
And in cases where they both agreed, it was, okay, this is clearly the right thing to do. If you disagreed, okay, I'm going to lean a little more towards my target market. But you can do this for different, you can do it for any aspect of your book, the cover design, for the outline, for a chapter title, engage your audience. And now with the cover design, so originally, so I did, I first started out, I was feeling frustrated as having trouble with uh, my initial editor who ultimately dropped out of the, the project. I was feeling so frustrated and feeling, oh, this is a big setback. So I went out to Fiverr and I just found a whole bunch of people, paid them about $10 each and said, here's a concept, give me a cover design. Now I wasn't expecting a great cover from Fiverr, but for a little over a hundred dollars, I got a whole bunch of different designs. I really said, carte blanche, come up with whoever you want. And so that was great for getting all sorts of different ideas coming back to me very cheap. Now, then I did get a professional designer. And with that designer, she, she and her team came up with a bunch of designs as well. This was the one that was a clear winner. Both sets of my panel uh, said, yep, we like this design best. And it was this kind of generic, as you saw with the icons, kind of the clip arty, businessy people. But it was generic businessy. I said, OK, I'm, I'm good with going with this. Wasn't my first choice, but I also know I am not a design expert. I know where my limitations are, <laughs> listen to the market. I said, okay, we're going to go with this. I'm, I'm good with that. I said, but if we do it, I want to make the icons relevant to the content. Now, if it was just about making it relevant to the content on the cover, okay, that's nice, but uh, how important is it? What we did is each chapter has a theme, right? There's networking, negotiating, communication, leadership. Each one has a corresponding icon. Now, all the icons are on the cover. Each chapter has the icon with it. Within the app, when you go to the communication category, you see the communication icon. You don't have to read communication, you recognize the icon. When I do social media posts, we use the iconography for whatever the theme of the post is. I'm rolling out a blog, blog categories, they're going to use that iconography. And I've added in a couple others that are similar in iconography. When I go and do talks, I use the same iconography on the slides. And what this is doing, this is creating consistent branding because again, our content is not just between the pages of the book. Our content is in any channel we want and you want to be consistent in your messaging. Now, most of us were consistent. We have here, here's the catchphrase, here's the tagline, here's what I'm known for. But you can do that visually with iconography. You can do it with your cover. You can do it with lots of different things. You just want to make sure as you go multi-channel, you are consistent in your branding. Yeah, and I love that. I think that's so brilliant of, of how you did the, the cover design and, and really creative too. I mean, I had never seen anyone use icons in the way that you have. And it just also seems so appropriate to, to you and your style. <laughs> yeah. And it's also, it's a very elegant cover. And one of the things like, you know, I, I hope our reader, our listeners go and get your book and really to hold it, even if you don't read it, because it, it feels so professional. Like, you know, some books scream self-published, you know, some books scream like, I, this wasn't a traditional book feel like this. Your book just is, it has the right look and feel, you know, it, it's, it makes you want to read it. And, and this is a big deal, you know, and that consistency with the icons, I think just really drives it home. But it has such a, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's clear you didn't you didn't skimp on production. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I know tell me, tell tell the readers a little bit about your production path. Because I remember there there was a little bit, you know, you definitely had had a few things to deal with. Yeah. And it it's true. Look, people do judge books by your cover. Yep. The thing is your cover isn't going to sell your book. Your cover might catch their attention, but if the content isn't good, no sale. If your cover is bad, they're not even gonna look at the content, right? So all these little production things, these can only hurt you. A, a great example is picking your font, right? I never even thought about fonts before I started research. <laughs> oh, you have to choose a font. If you, no one knows this font, you've never thought about the fonts in your book unless you happen to be like a font or layout person. Right. And you've never noticed it because it's just there and it works. If it was a bad font, 
you notice and you say, I'm having a bad experience on this book, but the good font doesn't help. It doesn't, oh, you should get this book. This has such a beautiful font. <laughs> and that's right. A but a bad font can hurt you. Yeah. But, and a good font helps you, but no one, you know, it's a good font if no one notices the font, basically. <laughs> all these aspects of production. It is your cover. It is, and I mean, not just your cover design, but even the physical cover. Is it well done? Is the binding well what done? I'm saying, and the, and the quality of the paper is, is, is just exquisite. I mean, it really just thoughtfulness every, every step. And you do have to pay attention to this. So this is about being an entrepreneur. And if you are an entrepreneur and starting your own company, what are you doing? Well, you can't necessarily do everything yourself, right? But you have to pay attention. You can't just say to your accountant, oh, hey, uh, yeah, make sure everything's paid. Well, you have to like check in. <laughs> Budget looking like, how are we doing? What's our cash flow position? Marketing, okay, how many leads are we getting? And what's the cost per lead? And is this working for us? You're not doing the work, but you better pay attention. You better supervise. You better understand. And that's true of this, this process. I had to lay out was unfortunately a challenge. It took us three months. I was not happy with the layout. Whereas like cover design, beautiful job. And we spent a lot of time going back and forth on the cover, tweaking it, but we were moving forward. With layout, it's something else you never notice. Now, my book turned out to be a little challenging for a layout process. And I didn't even know this from the start. So we have, in addition to words, well, we have section headings, right? There are sections and subsections, and that impacts the layout. I also have a lot of footnotes. I prefer footnotes over endnotes because I hate flipping to the end to go find them. <laughs> but that impacts it. And I had to look every single page. Okay, how's this looking? Is there too much white space, not enough white space? And in fact, there were even, unfortunately, their own quality control process I wasn't happy with towards the end because every time a change was made, I'd get all the sheets to sign off on. And I remember one time, all of a sudden we're near the end and at the end of chapter nine, so you normally have the last word and then white space, all of a sudden there was chapter 10, <laughs> starting with the drop cap, right? That big lyric starts the chapter that they had just eyeballed the page Clearly this was not appropriate. Yeah. No one was checking. You have to be on top of every aspect. If you self-publish, if you go a traditional route, now if it's a big house, okay, they're probably, you know, Harper Collins, I think they know how to do this. But if it's a smaller house, if they're not as experienced, you may want to put in your contract that you want to review this stuff, that you want to have certain you will rights. review it. Yeah, they, they, they let the authors review. But you know, something that, cause I remember there was, when you were during the layout process, and this is important too, cause I remember you reached out to me once because they were telling you something was fine and you were like, I really don't think it's fine. And so you reached out to me and I was like, no, that's not fine. Is, is what I, or did I say it was fine? I think you said, if I remember right, it was how we did uh, lists. And so I have, for example, when I talk about leadership, so leadership might be within the leadership chapter, there are the sections, then subsections. And then I, I had like a list of, here's a bunch of topics, like here's 10 different things to think about leadership. And so I saw that as you're one down, you're two down, this is three layers down. And they saw it as, no, this is list. This is one layer from the bottom. So whether you're three down or four down or five down, I would have said it should be a different font because you're level four versus level five. And they said, no, you're, you're bottom, you're one up from bottom, you're two up from bottom. And that's how they went with it. I remember I reached out to you. And this is something I couldn't even find any documentation on this. And all these 1500 articles, no one talked about. <laughs> And thankfully I had someone like you, I could turn to, to know and get that input and get that feedback. And it ultimately said, no, no, this is fine. Right. And I went with it. <laughs> but that's the level of detail you really should be paying attention to if you want to put out an A plus quality product. And that's why you need people. If you haven't done this before, you need great people like Robin who have done it, who can be there to say, hey, what about this? Or here's how to think about it. 
Yeah, and that's why I was bringing it up because I think it's not even just about paying attention, but sometimes it's also good. Like if something really seems wrong to, to, to find someone that, that would know that maybe, you know, if, if you're, if, especially if you've been struggling with a provider and you don't necessarily trust their answers of all their answers because you've been burned by some of their answers before or whatever, then, you know, to have somebody to reach out to, uh, to be able to say, hey, you know, is, is this really okay? Or is this something that I really need to make them fix? The, I, I want to share the best advice that I think you gave me. And I don't know if I've said this to you before. After my first editor dropped out, she has said, this just, it needs too much work. Now it killed me because I sent her the full manuscript prior to the contract. I said, look it over, give me a quote. And so she should have looked it over and the should not have caught off, off guard. But she right. said, well, just, it needs too much work. Now that sent me into a panic because I thought, oh my God, am I a horrible writer? Am, am I just, I've been fooling myself and I am so bad. And thankfully I went to an editor I used to work with at a company. And I went to a friend of ours who is a, a literary agent. And both of them, I said, can you just look over a couple pages and tell me, is this trash? And they both said, no, no, you're fine. Yes, you need an editor. We all do. <laughs> right. you're, you're, you're at the right point. This is, this is good enough. You're at the editor point. And I said, okay, why is this, why is this throwing me? And you looked and you had a really great insight because my chapters, I go into a lot of different, oh, and think about leadership and this and that and this other thing. It can feel a little disjointed. And I do try to make transitions, but still it's, it's a lot of A, B, C, D within it. You said, you know, add an introduction. I just would add sometimes as little as two paragraphs that just laid out the chapter and set it up. And that made such a huge difference. And this editor, who she had 30 some years of experience doing business books, this was her area, but she didn't see it. She just said, ah, this is wrong. Now, maybe you could argue that's a developmental issue, but with 30 years experience, you think she would have kind of identified something like that, have seen it before, but it was great to have that outside perspective that you brought and that I think made a huge difference in the book. Yeah, and that's why I really believe, and, and you know, even when I'm working on a book with a, with a client and we're going to the traditional publisher, um, I look forward to when their editors read it. And I hope that they're gonna have some ideas for how we can make it even better. Because if, if there's one thing about writing a book that's always true, uh, is that it's a very iterative process. I mean, there's just, nobody, nobody's first draft is worth anything. And really multiple drafts, it takes multiple drafts to really get it dialed in to the point that uh, it's ready to go. I mean, you know, we, we turn in excellent manuscripts and they always have some ideas to make it even better. And that's so important. Yeah, and it's, it's funny throughout the process I remember when I, when I did the first, I'll say final draft, right? I did my own internal edits. I looked and thought, okay, like, yeah, this is great. And then a few weeks later, I remember thinking, oh my God, this is garbage. I can't <laughs> able to read this. And then a few weeks later, oh, this is great again. And then a few weeks after that, this is garbage. And partially based on feedback, partially based on just my own blindness at like, well, of course this is obvious. What's well, obvious because I've read and reread this thing now 20 times. Right. <laughs> you really do need all those different outside perspectives because you just, you lose yours completely. Yeah, totally. And, and I think the closer you get to done, the harder it is to have that perspective. <laughs> yes, very true. Great. Well, Mark, I cannot believe how this time has just flown by. I can't believe it's already been an hour, but uh, what thought would you like to leave our listeners with today? If you are thinking about doing a book, don't think of it as a book. Think of it as you have content that you want to get out. The book is a key part of that strategy. It might be the, the kind of centerpiece of your strategy. It might be a stepping stone of your larger strategy, but understand what that strategy is. And this is where, again, if you're not used to doing this, 
get an expert like Robin, get someone who can talk you through it, who can help you figure this out, what that strategy is, how the book fits into it, what other things will fit into it before, after, concurrent with the book. And then you can generate the content and think about that content, not just for the book, but for this multi-channel presence and how when you pitch your book, you're saying it up as one part of this larger strategy that's gonna make it much more appealing, whether it's to a publisher, an agent, or just as part of your overall strategy for your own personal branding. Outstanding. Thank you again for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to another amazing episode of The Author's Corner. You're one step closer to writing the world-changing book you've dreamed about for years. To access today's show notes and other helpful resources, simply visit our website at theauthorscorner.com. A positive review would be appreciated. Until next time.